Well, my background, I'm a medical epidemiologist. I started off in surgery, but I felt the call of epidemiology. And um, during the early 90s, I had to run a course teaching people epidemiology. And um, we went down to the Johnson & pub just to give them a kind of interesting thing. And we found that the pub was really run down and no one was bothering about it. And we knew there was this big heritage in the States. So we were a bit embarrassed, especially as we had two guys from CDC who were lecturing on our course. And so we said, well, we must have a Johnson & Society. And that's how it started. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI, uh, was founded by Don Berwick, uh, who you may remember ran for governor. He's kind of the guru of improvement. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to improve health and healthcare around the world uh, and to make care safer and better for patients and for just general people who happen to live in a community. And we do this uh, with a bedrock of scientific quality improvement. And most people think quality improvement, you just go out and kind of do it. Mm -hmm. But as we've been discussing, it all involves a scientific method. Right. You know, prediction, testing, confirming, adjusting, constantly running cycles to prove or disprove that your theory of causation, mm -hmm. how you get from a change to a better outcome, is true. In a way, the miasma theory was right in that there are lots of factors. Right. Your general health, your well-being. Sure. They even brought in your morality. Oh, yes. I'm afraid, you know, if you were immoral, you were going to get cholera. Um, but, but that whole idea, the holistic approach, isn't wrong as such. But they missed out the single cause. And people have often said, well, how, did, how was Snow so absolutely strong on this? I mean, even William Budd, who was a contemporary, who came up with the theory of waterborne typhoid. He also hedged his bets, but Snow didn't. And I think it's very much his, his, because he was a very logical man, but also you look at his life. Mm. He starts off as a young doctor in the minefields mm. of the north of England. And the mines in those days were disgusting. You'd go down underground, there was no sanitation. If it rained, they'd flood. Mm. They had no way to wash their hands, they had no toilets. And he observed this. Yeah and commented on it um, and in his 1849 he said you know there must be something going on so he was very close to the germ theory although he never he was years ahead before people like Robert Koch came up with the germ theory but but he was close and so he was saying it's something it's something to do with them not washing their hands and ingesting it from the water well, first, I, I think it's uh, only fair to say there's no William Farr Society. And you may wonder why I would bring that up. Well, William Farr was wrong. Right. But he did use statistics, and one might say epidemiology, to come to the wrong conclusion. Uh, what he did, as you may know, is to calculate the uh, occurrence of cholera around uh, London, and especially around the Thames, mm -hmm. uh, by its ele the elevation of the land above the Thames. Okay. And he showed a really strong correlation between elevation and lower risk of getting cholera, because he believed that miasmas, these noxious gases of, you know, come from human feces and animal waste and all that kind of stuff, all these bad gases were causing cholera. Uh, and unfortunately, his analysis didn't account for all the other factors that might have been important. Uh, income level, what kind of house you lived in, what kind of water you got. All he did was have this theory about miasmas from the Thames, and it looks really good. If you look at that graph and his data, it's pretty compelling, but it's wrong. There's been a lot of criticism, in a way, of the way Jon Snow and some of the others of his time have become an icon of epidemiology. Yeah, yeah. And people have said, well, why him? I mean, he wasn't the only one doing maps. He wasn't the only one who was beginning to look at statistics. But what was very interesting about John Snow, um, I think the deductive reasoning, the fact that he was, um, yes, he was a qualified doctor, but he was very much a scientist of a doctor. And he believed in measurement and he was against the flow of the times. Um, there were other people who thought that cholera might be waterborne, but it was only as part of a general theory um, people sometimes want to know, you know, when did epidemiology start? Right. I mean, we didn't really call it epidemiology till well later in the century. It's really a 20th century phenomenon right. as such. They wouldn't have thought of it like that at all. 
they understood epidemics because they had the word in French, <laughs> epidemic. <laughs> yeah. um, but it would it could be just one or two cases, maybe even one case if it was a nasty um, disease. And the, the idea of researching those epidemics, they would have called like a study, mm -hmm. or um, Snow often referred to the great experiment right. that needed to be done to show that, that water was the cause. So when this vast outbreak of hundreds of cases you said occurred, he used basic epidemiology, and, and we use the term shoe leather epidemiology to describe what he did. He got on his feet and walked around and started asking where are these illnesses occurring, and he began to plot them out uh, on a map, uh, which is uh, sometimes called the ghost map or John Snow's map, uh, so he could see patterns. Epidemiologists essentially look for patterns of disease and then make a prediction or find an association between hypothetical causes or origins of the outbreak. When you read very short accounts of this map or when you see it presented in other documentaries or whatever, you often get the impression that, that Jon Snow is you know, walking around Soho with a clipboard and this map and putting dots and making this histogram as he walks around, which is not true. Um, and in fact, the more scholarly accounts that I've read make it sound like he made the whole map after, like oh, yeah. well after this was over. Yes, that's right. And so did he have a map he was making in his head? Did he have a sketch? Did he just well, use tables and have a picture in his head? Or what did um, he do? He was, um, he was very good at drawing up tables. Mm -hmm. And it was something, because of his work with anesthesia, he was very good at working with compounds and drawing up effects and things. So he would have been making lists of the deaths. And he would have some people like the local doctors and Henry Whitehead, the curate, collecting the death See data. You know. What's very interesting is notebooks, which he kept almost every day of his life, for the period that he's investigating this, is the time when he doesn't make, he doesn't... He's too busy to write it down. Busy. And um, what I think he was doing um, was uh, uh, not using a map, but he was collecting addresses and so on. And when he was presenting the information to the Board of Inquiry, they set up an inquiry immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was a very nasty outbreak. With, mm -hmm some important people had died in addition right. to the four. And um, so he, he was presenting the information and that's when he drew the map to convince them. The map that's on this lovely John Snow Society yes. mug. So he had, um, if you like, he'd got the data and this was just another way of demonstrating it. It wasn't how he solved the outbreak. When I talk to my students about this, I, I always ask them, so did uh, John Snow perform a case control study? which is fundamental in epidemiology. It's the greatest tool for working up outbreaks that we have. In a case control study, you study the exposure of the cases, in this case to water pumps, mm -hmm. and the exposure of the controls to people who were not cases, who right. were not sick, and their exposure to water pumps, and there should be a difference. Jon Snow did not look at controls. He only looked at cases. People were sick and arrayed them on a map and said, these are closer to the Broad Street water pump and here's some exceptions to prove the rule. So as the father of epidemiology, the fundamental tool for working up outbreaks was not what he actually used. And the rest of London not getting sick is not considered a control? Well, he didn't really talk about it that way. Right. Uh, and if you read his stuff, it, it wasn't, he, he wasn't looking, he, he had a vague idea that there were these people who weren't sick, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a disciplined way. It, it. It, uh, Reverend Whitehead, mm -hmm. was, uh, who's not known as the father of epidemiology, uh, he was a local guy and he knew everybody and so he was able to go around and ask questions. First he found more cases, but he also interviewed non-cases and that was more like a case control study. So maybe Reverend Whitehead ought to be the father of epidemiology. <laughs> I mean, but, but John Snow, what he did was really quite remarkable. So um, it's at a particular moment in time before microscopy is fully evolving as a proper science before the hygiene methods have really got going. Yeah. Um, and yet Snow is 40 years ahead of his time. In a way, it's tragic he didn't live to see that. And what would he have contributed? Masses, I think. Isn't it interesting that uh, you're talking about how uh, theories, some based on empiric observation, some of them remarkably astute, coexisted side by side with nonsense. Yes. And it's no different. It's still true. Today, yes. right? I mean, theories, and, and I'm not gonna take sides, but creationism, uh, uh, homeopathic remedies, I mean, these are wild, to me, wild theories that exist c 
go right alongside of modern medicine with synthetic drugs that are targeted to, to confirmations of proteins uh, and all this uh, data we have about evolution and climate change and so forth. So I think it's a natural, we hold on to the kind of mysterious, the not easily explained phenomenon and theories and at the same time people will say, well, you know, there's this thing called science and we can actually use it to predict.